to the Cinema Gold Show with your host, Larry Lease. From the small screen to the big screen, we cover all the latest entertainment news. Join us on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to the Cinema Gold Show. I'm your host, Larry Lease. Today we're diving into the latest TV and movie news from around the industry. But first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Poddex. Visit poddex.com and use promo code CINEMAGOLD for 10% off your first purchase. Our first main topic is the news that Stranger Things may be coming to a close very soon. Stranger Things Season 4 is set to set up the beloved Netflix series for a clear, clean, specific, definite ending, according to star David Harbour, who plays Hawkins Police Department Chief and Eleven's adopted father, Jim Hopper, teased in a new interview. Harper also teased a rebirth of sorts of, of, for Hopper in the manner of Gandalf's resurrection from the Lord of the Rings, noting that Hopper is at his purest and most vulnerable in season four. He also hyped up Stranger Things 4, describing it as a big, beautiful season that is bigger in scope. It's also his favorite season of the bunch so far. Speaking with Collider during promotions for Black Widow, Harper said, Stranger Things Season 4 is bigger, that's the first thing, in scope, in scale, even in the idea that we're not in Hawkins anymore. Locale-wise, we're bigger. We're introducing new stuff, but we're also tightening and wrapping up in a certain direction to make it have a clear, clean, specific, and definite ending at some point, which I can't really talk about. At one point, Stranger Things creators, the Duffer Brothers, had planned to wrap up the Netflix series in four seasons. But then last year they said, Season 4 won't be the end. We know what the end is, and we know when it is. The pandemic has given us time to look ahead, figure out what is best for the show. Starting to fill that out gave us a better idea of how long we need to tell the story. Stranger Things 4 is really my favorite season, Harbor added later. I just love it. The scripts always get better. The Duffer Brothers, they started, they started out in season one and so tight and good and intimate in a certain way. And these guys go in a different direction of which the fans have multiple takes on. But I will say, the writing continues to be of its particular specific genre. Whatever they're doing, each season is just extraordinary. And this time again, we top it. Like I feel, it's a big, beautiful season. I can't wait for people to see it. Harbour's words echo what we've heard from other members of the Stranger Things squad. Finn Wolfhard, who plays Mike Wheeler, as described season four as the darkest season there's ever been. Every year it gets amped up. Every year it gets funnier and darker and sadder. Executive producer Sean Levy noted that the COVID-19 delays allowed the creators to finish writing all the episodes before they began filming. And as a result, the quality of these scripts are exceptional, maybe even better. As for his character Harper, Harper said... In season four, he's at his purest. He's at his most vulnerable in a sense. He's been in this Russian prison, so we get to reinvent him in a sense. He gets to have a rebirth from what he had become. We'd always sort of plan this almost resurrection of you have Gandalf dies, Gandalf the Grey reemerge. And I'm really interested in this resurgence of him. We do explore a lot of threads in his life that have merely been hinted at that we get to see a lot more of. And there's some real surprises that you know nothing about that will start to come out in this and play big as the series goes on. Stranger Things 4 is set to release in 2022 on Netflix. second topic for today is our review of Loki Episode 3. Warning, this review contains spoilers for Marvel's Loki Episode 3. The third episode of Marvel's Loki, Lamentis, threw our main man and the variant he's been chasing into a deadly situation from which there ultimately appeared to be no escape. It also made Loki canonically bisexual in the MCU. 
and open a can of TVA worms that will keep us wondering about the true nature and identity of the timekeepers for a while longer. There was a lot going in the show's most Doctor Who episode yet, which abandoned its crime procedural vibe to focus on splashing Marvel's cash further than previous installments. It mostly succeeded in doing so, considering its focus was entirely on two characters plotting a Snowpiercer-esque escape from a doomed moon. Luckily, Tom Hiddleston and Sophia Martino have terrific chemistry, and it's a joy to watch them scrap at the edge of Annihilation while marooned together and forced to come up with a way off the rocks. Sylvie's original grand plan, which involved bombing the sacred timeline and ambushing the timekeeper's hiding place while the TVA scrambled to put out temporal fires, went phenomenally awry thanks to the god of mischief, and he may end up regretting it. There was no regret on my end. Watching Loki and Sylvie trade jibes and play games with each other made for a cracking episode of television. I can already envision the many memes spreading far and wide across the internet from their prickly banter. The two butted stubborn heads on Elementus. One as they peacock their magical talents in some hilariously ineffectual ways. Naturally, because Loki, this eventually involved getting drunk and making a suspicious spectacle of himself, while trying to charm Sylvie into opening up to him about her whole deal. You can take the prince out of Asgard, but you can't take the Asgard out of the prince. To be serious for a moment, It was interesting to see Loki finally acknowledged as bisexual when he connected with Sylvie during all this. I mean, I imagine it means a lot to some other people. Hiddleston and Di Martino both gripped the screen with ease, and along with some stunning visuals cloaked in, quote, bisexual lighting, a strong mood was definitely set on the beleaguered moon. There was an energy to the episode that kept me longing for scraps of information about Sylvie and hoping that she and Loki could find some real together as two determined Independent variants who refuse to do what they're told. Whether this story will find Loki and the Enchantress forging a strong bond if they ever get out of the Lamentis bind is still unclear. Right now, that friendship is only just starting to be earned. But of course, it's deeply ironic to witness Loki pleading for a trustworthy arrangement with Sylvie. The man is notoriously backstabby. But he certainly doesn't much like the shoe being on the other foot. And by chasing her, he's almost simultaneously broken his trust with Mobius. Alas, yes, episode three was indeed Mobius free. But by the time its cliffhanger ending landed, he was very much in my heart after Loki discovered that the TVA are in fact made up of memory wiped human variants, plucked from the timeline and pushed into servitude at the universe's most beige and orange bureaucracy. Who were you before the TVI, TVA snatched you, Mobius? A chill beach bum teaching drunk tourists how to jet ski? Or a landlocked retail employee who dreamed of one day moving to the coast? We have to know, and hopefully by the time this series ends, we will. Justice for Mobius. Amentus does take its time in picking at the fraying edge of the silly mystery, however. She insisted that Loki isn't who she is anymore, and revealed herself to have a different past than him. She was told she was adopted up front, but doesn't really remember her mother, and has spent her entire life running from the TVA. Where in time is Sylvie from, and why are the roots of her past so different if she was once him? Things just don't really add up, and the mystery of the sacred timeline deepens once more as we head into the back half of the series. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the spectacle and pricey action sequences that this episode has to offer. It's the most action we've seen in the show to date, but it's action that became increasingly problematic, at least on first watch, as the lack of peril was a little frustrating. We're only halfway through Loki, and there's no way he won't find a path off Lamentis, right? Even at the climax, when all hope was seemingly lost, I knew that he'd probably be okay. The cliffhanger does instill a bit of the hopelessness that we haven't really seen in the MCU since the devastating last few moments of Avengers Infinity War, though. And I'm surprised and kind of delighted that the show wasn't afraid to leave things there for now. I'm going to leave this episode with a rating 4 out of 5 stars. And our final topic is our review of F9. Fast and Furious is back 
with an absolute bonkers new adventure. How could F9 possibly shock and awe audiences after all that's already gone down over the past 20 years? They do it by turning hard into familiar fast and furious terrain of macho melodrama and full throttle plot twists. Then taking the car stunts to absolutely outrageous new heights. And his latest returning director Justin Lin brings plenty of his signature character moments and skill for captivatingly capturing the complicated stunt sequences making for a sequel that is both outlandish and big-hearted. Vin Diesel returns as Dom Toretto, who is living off the grid with his ride-or-die partner in crime, Letty. That is, until a cryptic message pulls the crew back together for another Save the World mission. They team up with Roman, Tej, Ramsey, and Mia, then go up against their scowling new foe, Jacob, played by John Cena. Their rivalry leads to brutal one-liners, high-tension flashbacks, untold collateral damage, and countless unspoken civilian casualties. Of course, the screenplay by Lynn and Daniel Casey weaves in repeated plot twists and familiar faces. More secret family members are unearthed, and another beloved crew member is thankfully brought back from the dead. Sung Kang reprises the role of Han, bringing a cool charisma, sexy smile, and gunslinger swagger that shows he's ready for a spin-off of his own. Perhaps one on Han's lost years? Where's he been? Since Tokyo Drift. Also returning is Charlize Theron as the nefarious hacker Cypher, plus a slew of crowd-pleasing cameos from the extended Fast and Furious family. However, the biggest thrills come from absolutely bonkers action sequences. Though the laws of physics are name-dropped, they need not apply here. How do you make a car chase that one-ups everything Fast and Furious fans have seen before? Len and his team turn to new spins on the series' best ideas. An opening jungle chase throws us back into the wild world of the Toretto clan, offering edge-of-your-seat excitement and nail-bitingly close calls. Then we see a callback to the incredible bank heist of Fast Five, where a massive vault becomes a devastating toad flail. This time, powerful magnets pull and push cars and plenty else through bustling streets and buildings, while heroes barrel towards a climax that takes them to a whole new frontier and spectacular level of suspension of disbelief. As these movies have, gone, have grown from L.A. street races to car versus submarine showdowns, its characters have essentially evolved into superheroes. F9 addresses this with a funny bit in which a rattled Roman argues they may be literally invincible. How else could they not only live through all the adventures they've been through, but also do so without a scratch. In every frame, Dobbs' crew looks like they could be posing for a character poster or perfume ads. Gorgeous, cool, and stoic. No matter what possible scenario, they've just been hurled through. Lynn, le Lynn leads into the unflappable fantasy and it makes the melodrama elements all the more exhilarating. Without revealing too much, let's just say there's a serious beef between these characters. Diesel and Cena prove a perfectly matched pair, and their moments together sizzle. Cena's movie career has been marked with comedy, but this former pro wrestler knows how to deliver a fierce frown and furrow bro for masterful intimidation. Crafty low lighting causes his strong features to cast sharp shadows, making him look all the more fearsome. Meanwhile, Diesel's jutting jaw and hard stare has their face off sparking with macho wrath. They are earnest yet repressed in a way that makes such scenes deliciously campy, and Lynn knows it. There's a sly glee throughout F9 from the ludicrous stunts to the conv convoluted soap opera plot to a spirited one-liner about a villain's great dental plan. Lynn knows that the Fast and Furious movies are mad fun not just because of the action, but because of how unapologetically outlandish they get at every turn, all while staying straight-faced. Beyond the wild fun within F9 also boss, boasts phenomenal cinematography. Director of photography Stephen Winden previously worked with Lynn on three Fast and Furious films. So it's little wonder that his coverage of the complicated action sequences is strategic and striking. Even when cutting between multiple locations, a horde of characters, and a parade of different vehicles, the geography and action is always in focus and clear cut. However, more stunning are the quiet moments, breaths between action and exposition, which Winden starkly tells a story with framing. 
For instance, when Jacob first blazes onto the scene, he does so in a car that looks similar to Dom's, down to the racing stripes across its hood. An aerial shot shows the vehicles in a perfect circle of tire marks, diametrically opposed foes, with one sharp image, Winden illustrates their connection and their distance. Then bounding from London to Tokyo to Cologne and beyond, Winden gives us breathtaking landscapes, both urban and wild. He makes the most of each, turning every location into a character as glossy and gorgeous as our flawless heroes. This film isn't just fast and furious, it's also breathtakingly beautiful. Cinema Gold Show. If you like what you hear, subscribe to our podcast on all major podcast platforms. Find us on YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search The Cinema Gold Show. Let us know your thoughts on the topics we covered. Send us a tweet at Cinema Gold Show. Or you can find us on Instagram at The Cinema Gold Show. And check us out on Facebook, The Cinema Gold Show. Follow us there for even more content. If you want to support this show, you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash cinemagold. Your support helps grow this channel. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching The Cinema Gold Show. If you liked what you heard, subscribe to our podcast on all major platforms. Follow us on Twitter at Cinema Gold Show. And like us on Instagram at The Cinema Gold Show. Support the show by buying us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash cinemagold. As always, thank you for listening.